Okay, I will get started now. So I'm just so glad to be here today and I just wanted to welcome everyone here today for this talk. And thanks so much for taking time in your busy lives to come here in conversation with our esteemed guest, Professor Angie Wiley. And as much as you may be beaming in from all the four corners of the world, each of us is always located on a specific place. And I just want to remind us that I am right now today on the unceded indigenous territories of the Coast Salish people and that's specifically the Basquiam and the Squamish and the tsleil And I was thinking, although many of you that have been living in this area for a long time, I've probably heard a lot of these land acknowledgements and have heard the term unceded. I think it's important to reflect on what this means. Uh, I noticed uh, today that my computer's autocorrect doesn't know this term yet. It's not really part of the whatever the Apple or the Google universe. And I'm not sure that everyone always does know what unseated means. And my computer today wanted to autocorrect it to call it unneeded land. And I can assure you that the land is not uh, unneeded. Um, what it means is that there are never any treaties or agreements between the settlers and indigenous people here to share this land, it was just taken. And in the last decade, especially I've watched many reckonings as settlers and officials of the state start to acknowledge the century long atrocity of the forced residential schools that five generations of indigenous children suffered through. And I feel like this awareness is slowly building but there's been less work and acknowledgement about the history of land theft, which is an important task ahead as just one part of what a real reconciliation might mean. And for those of you like Angie and others that are not you know, based in Canada, we've had this Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission and, and, and long conversations for a long time. But as one of my indigenous colleagues said, we also need a lot more truth too. Um, so in preparation for today's talk, I reached out to one of the leading indigenous scholars in Canada working on sexuality studies, Kim Tallbear. And it turns out that our guests uh, today and Talbert have written together. Talbert asks us, besides a legacy of land theft and residential schools and much more, how might colonial frameworks continue to shape the lives of everyone living here? And Talbert points to a legacy of colonial notions of relationship making that shape not only institutions and legal systems, but our own innermost assumptions and sensibilities and epistemologies. And that's something I think is shared deeply with our, with our guests today. So with that, let me just give you a few brief um, housekeeping notes before I introduce our guest. So in terms of today, uh, I will finish this up and then we'll have our talk uh, by Professor Wiley. And then afterwards we'll have a Q&A. And if you look at your screen, you can see the, the Q&A box, you can open that up. And at any point you can ask a question. And then at the end of the talk, I will go over the list of the questions and select some. I might, you know, pull some together or I'll look for repetition and I'll be the one that will be um, asking our, our guest. Uh, just a reminder that the event is recorded and it will be available on our departmental website in the coming weeks. And when it is available, we will send you an email to everyone that's attending. And also that there is closed captioning available. Sometimes it's quite humorous um, to see what the computer thinks is, is happening. Um, but you can enable it by selecting live transcript at the bottom of your screen. And now I'll do a brief introduction of our guest, Professor Angie Wiley. So she is an associate professor of women, gender, sexuality studies at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst as well as the graduate program director and now even interim chair of the program and the director of the five college women's studies research center so she's not was... anymore last year oh good 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 okay that's all I I thought, practicing at the same time how could you possibly do that okay um but it is true that you are currently a prominent scholar at the inner at the interstices of queer feminist theory critical relationality and science studies her work on non-monogamy, colonial sexual science and critical materialisms has appeared in Feminist Studies, Signs, the Journal of Women in Culture and Society, 
feminist formations, the gender, the Journal of Gender Studies, Science, Technology, and Human Values, Archives of Sexual Behavior and Sexualities, and also in edited collections on monogamy, on materialism, and on the science of difference. She is the author of Undoing Monogamy, The Politics of Science and the Possibilities of Biology by Duke in 2016. And the following year was the co-editor of Queer Feminist Science Studies, a reader by the University of Washington Press. And just one note I'll say is that her book, Undoing Monogamy, is a powerful display of critical analysis, getting deeply into the expectations for monogamy that underlie not only heteronormative, but also homonormative notions and politics. And as well, the co-editing the anthology, Queer Feminist Science Studies, Professor Wiley also writes about the production of scientific knowledge in relation to our animal kin. So I also welcome somebody deeply interested in the more than human. Um, I feel like we are kin in that, in, in that and other ways. And these are both outstanding books and I'm excited to hear today's talk and would like us to offer a warm welcome to Professor Wiley. Thank you. Is that working? Okay, cool. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, and thank you, Dasha and Melanie, um, for setting everything up. Um, Hold on, I'm trying to figure out how to move things around here so I can see everything on my screen. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'll begin by naming that the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where I teach and where I'm zooming in from today, occupies unseated, uh, thank you, I don't have to define it, uh, unseated um, Pocumtuck and Nipmuc lands. Um, so the title of my talk for today is Theorizing Eros, Queer Genealogies of Critical Materialism. Oops. Um, this talk is about the stakes of storytelling about human nature. It's about how integral settler sexuality is to dominant understandings of what it means to be human or what winter calls being man. It's about our material affective attachments to sexuality as a knowledge system. It's about the relentlessness of that system and the invisible ways it structures how we understand who and what we are. The paper is also about how we humans, creatures, populations embody stories, how stories enable and delimit, materialize and rematerialize. It's about the persistence of the dichotomy between the stuff and the storytelling, between ontology and epistemology, as it were. It's about disciplinary proper objects and the resilience of epistemologies of domination. Um, this is a quick overview for folks who like to know where you're going. Um, so I'm gonna really, really quickly uh, go over some pre-theoretical assumptions of my talk. I find that's helpful in a wildly interdisciplinary talk where you have no idea who's in the room. Um, so uh, on the stakes of colonial sexual science, a super brief intro, and then um, theorizing critical materialism, and uh, talk a little bit about biopossibility. Um, and uh, queer ethics of undoing, and then uh, move on to thinking about erotic biopossibility as perhaps a post-positivist framework for thinking slash being human. Um, some more experimental part of my talk. So um, I'd like to begin by stating a few of the pre-theoretical assumptions that frame my thinking here. So Sexuality is a historically recent knowledge system, uh, a fictive unity, as Foucault says. Its formation, as we know it, is a colonial and white supremacist one. Um, colonial sexual science, aka sexual science, uh, does harm uh, by offering reductive understandings of behavior, desire, and belonging by normalizing racist and sexist storytelling that undergirds the differential valuation of lives and by naturalizing the privatization of wealth and care through the um, settler family. 
Um, in other words, I'm going to begin with the assumption that sexuality as an interpretive grid for making sense of human and more than human nature is a problem. I'm going to start uh, with the subtitle. So what do I mean by genealogies of critical materialism and move on to Eros. In particular, I want to explore what a conceptual shift to Eros might open up, the risks of its reconsolidation within neo-positivist frames, and experiment a bit with what accountability to a Lordian Eros might look like. So my thinking on these questions uh, began with feminist critiques of scientific storytelling, which ground claims to intersectionality and contingency, and importantly, historicize normativizing stories about nature. Following massively generative collective theorization of the costs of the conceptual distinction between nature and culture as phenomena and thus as objects of study, I've spent much of the last decade thinking about what a nature cultural approach to sexuality might look like. Attentive to the disciplinary hierarchies that threaten to co-opt interdisciplinarity into less critical projects. Envisioning the world nature culturally suggests the possibility of a radical reconfiguration of entrenched understandings of the proper, proper objects of humanistic and scientific knowledge making. Uh, and here we are at the proverbial table. Uh, I couldn't resist. Um, gathered to think about the conceptual and methodological resources necessary to building nature cultural approaches. To understanding biologies, the stuff, without reducing them to capital B biology, it's entrenched institutionalized academic study. If we're trying to hold what have been understood as nature and culture uh, together, what is this third space of study that doesn't get sort of co-opted back into a disciplinary site or usually co-opted back into um, a scientific sort of epistemology, a positivist sort of epistemology? Over the last two decades, we've seen a proliferation of literature that analyzes and often seeks to redress the costly legacies of a nature culture binary. These legacies are both disciplinary and material in every sense of the word. That is the idea of separate realms of nature and culture has contributed to the differential valuation of human and non-human lives. And the siloing of research has played its part in materializing worlds that quite literally embody an uneven distribution of benefit and harms. Part of the world and work before us, feminist science studies has long insisted, is to learn to know otherwise. I like to think of this collective effort to reimagine our world's nature culturally and thus to formulate resources for knowing them as a critical materialist science studies. The science studies piece is vital because it offers up a critical toolkit for navigating one of the biggest challenges, I think, for the materialist turn in the humanities, the persistent risk of conflating data with the objects they represent with nature, the body, life, matter itself. The materialist impulse in the humanities has sometimes taken the form of engagements with scientific data that take for granted and otherwise reinvigorate the normalized status of the historically and culturally specific categories from which they, the data emerged. Alongside now many peers, I'm interested in charting a queer path for feminist materialisms. I want to help keep our engagements with science's proper objects accountable to radical politics. In the spirit of accountability, I've long been concerned to elaborate the importance of co cultivating capacious archives for materialist thinking, ones that begin from the epistemological contributions of post-colonial and indigenous science studies in recognizing that the category of science has served a gatekeeping function, elevating and universalizing some ways of knowing while excluding others from its definition. The curation of such archives of materialist thought should not romantically elevate marginalized sciences to the status of truth or appropriate them within its own logics. Um, I'm uh, imagining here, uh, for those of you who are at Zoe's talk, the removing of the background. This is now how I'm visualizing what this appropriation looks like. Um, they should rather work toward a redistribution of epistemic authority. They should embody a post-positivist empiricism, accepting of the incommensurability of different kinds of data and critical of the persistent privileging of certain disciplinary ways of knowing over others. 
Here, I mean especially the privileging of reductionist forms of evidence, measurability over insight, over possibility. Feminist materialist archives might include, alongside more recognizable sorts of scientific data, art, poetry, literature, disparate cosmologies, and indeed the body knowledges that come out of critical theory. For now, I want to focus not so much on what capacious archives of body knowledges, uh, sorry, on the what of these capacious archives of body knowledges, but rather on the why, on the queer ethic of undoing that makes critical materialism critical. Oops. Uh, in the face of claims that feminism and or the humanities much, must take nature or bodies seriously, of course, uh, but where nature is often sadly under theorized, I found it useful to turn to those early critical Harrowayan insights, old favorites, uh, that brought me through queer and feminist theory to science studies. That is the sense that critical theory cannot afford to cede nature to science. Or as Linda Burke put it, we can't leave biology to the biologists. So um, nature is not a physical place. This is Haraway on nature um, uh, from Promises of Monsters. Uh, so nature is not a physical place to which one can go, nor a treasure to fence in or bank, nor an essence to be saved or violated. Nature is not hidden and so does not need to be unveiled. Nature is not a text to be read in the codes of mathematics and biomedicine. It is not the other who offers origin, replenishment and service. Neither mother, nurse, nor slave. Nature is not matrix, re matrix resource or tool for the reproduction of man. Nature is a topic of public discourse on which much churns, even the earth. And some more old Haraway, on queering. Uh, queering what counts as nature is my categorical imperative. Queering specific normalized categories is not for the easy frisson of transgression, but for the hope for livable worlds. Nature is indeed, as Haraway so eloquently reminded us some 30 years ago, a topic of public discourse on which much turns. In these first decades of the 21st century, disciplinarity no less than the earth has been reshaped by discourses of nature. The materialities, processes, and entanglements to which we refer when we invoke nature are being interrogated and theorized with a vigor and interest attuned to the stakes Haraway asserted, the very hope for livable worlds. Attention to the material consequences of how we understand what nature is has highlighted the limitations of relegating materiality to scientific disciplinary ways of knowing and representation to humanistic ones. Proliferating feminist theories of the Anthropocene, the Capitalocene, the Thulocene, and beyond, of, embody, of embodiment oriented to the molecular and of the coevolution of species and environments more generally, have been particularly generative in the contemporary queering of nature in and beyond critical theory. To queer as Haraway uses it here is of course to make strange what has been taken for granted. To queer specific normalized categories is to unsettle the obviousness of those categories and their reference, to open up questions that their normalized status forecloses. Knowing them better and unlearning them are different projects. I came to this project through my engagement with the neuroscience of monogamy the study of the molecular substrates attributed with orienting human nature toward coupling and nuclearity. Through intimate engagements with data and data making, um, I've come to contend that a queer feminist critical materialist approach should ask first, following Debelina Roy, how do we engage the data with queer feminist desires for new stories and forms? As we create approaches to science's proper objects, how do we ground them in queer and feminist critiques of the stability of those very categories, hormones, muscles, chromosomes, and brains, for example? How do we passionately challenge a view of biology as flat and predictable without locating our salvation in a framing that romanticizes nature's agency, contingency, self-organization, or plasticity? 
That is to say, such an approach should begin by querying the contexts that inform the intelligibility of our understandings of nature, deterministic or otherwise. Developed in the context of the study of human and non-human sexuality and relationality, my own modest contribution to this conversation has been to offer biopossibility as a conceptual resource in our collective toolbox. One that might aid in the project of holding the material discursive conditions of scientific knowledge production and the materialization of bodies in the same frame. I define biopossibility as a species and context specific capacity to embody socially meaningful traits and desires. I use biopossibilities rather than biological possibilities in an express effort to problematize the presumed locus of the logical. Biopossibility seeks to capture conceptually the way our creaturely capacities depend on the constraints of both intelligibility and matter. Concepts whose co-mediation has been described most capaciously still, I think, by the Haraway's concept of nature culture. I intend biopossibility as a tool for nature cultural thinking. A capacity to embody is always nature cultural, such that new biopossibilities emerge through entangled processes of biopolitical becoming. In these nature cultural worlds, nothing is merely textual, everything matters. That is to say, the intelligibility of a biopossibility and our capacity to actually embody it are interconnected in nonlinear ways. A theory of biopossibility does not require that we map or otherwise simplify those processes in order to name them. Biopossibility builds on other nature cultural research modalities to offer a conceptual alternative to biology for aspirationally post-disciplinary materialist research. Working from an archive of matter that exceeds the disciplinary locus of biology, biopossibility names those realized and unrealized species and context specific capacities as real, but not exhaustive or inevitable. I argue that to look at these capacities as biopossibilities is not only to acknowledge their materiality and its contingency, but also importantly to queer or to highlight the contingency of the categories themselves the historical, cultural, economic, and political intelligibility of the stuff we seek to understand nature culturally must be seen as part of the apparatus of research from which the object itself cannot be separated. Uh, take human sexuality, for example. So biopossibility helps us to read sexuality as a context-specific possibility. If sexuality is both embodied and context-sensitive in its materializations, other biopossibilities exist coterminously. What we call sexuality then is not only sexuality. Biopossibility offers us resources for a grounded reconsideration of the categories that shape how we read and measure ostensibly sexual variables, among other things, across science and non-science disciplines. In other words, whereas the study of biology tends toward ever more complex mapping of processes to better illuminate its objects, the study of its same objects as biopossibilities is oriented to the undoing of those objects. The nature cultural complexity of sexuality across different scales and evolutionary temporalities might from the perspective of biology suggest a more comprehensive theory of desire from the perspective of biopossibility, that complexity suggests the inadequacy of sexuality as an explanatory grid for the objects gathered under the moniker, thus holding open space for imagination in the service of new knowledges and new materializations. So, I wanna begin this section uh, with a more concrete example, but in a very shorthand way um, of what the lens of Eros can open up for science studies. So please forgive my very broad brush strokes. And if some part of this doesn't make sense, uh, I will try to explain it better in the Q&A. So pair bond formation is attributed to a gendered pair of hormones, oxytocin in females and vasopressin in males. Um, everybody knows what oxytocin is. It's the maternal hormone, the cuddle hormone, the love hormone. Um, uh, vasopressin, less popular, 
Um, it uh, controls species specific behaviors like territoriality and aggression. So the gendered story goes something like uh, women are monogamous for the same reason that they take care of their babies. Um, obvious, uh, but male monogamy is an evolutionary anomaly. You know, if uh, penis people are supposed to be spreading their sperm around based on the um, kind of storytelling about human nature that evolutionary biology likes to do, um, then it doesn't make sense. So uh, vasopressin comes in to answer this question. So male monogamy is then explained as something like pissing on what's yours so no one else will fuck with it. So um, in this kind of Zoom scenario, you can't really read the room and see if it's okay to have a potty mouth. Sorry, I'll try to rein it in a little bit. Um, so this is of course a much longer story. There's cross receptivity between these receptors, uh, meaning we don't know uh, which is acting on them, oxytocin or vasopressin. Um, so interesting and I wanna tell you everything about it, but I gotta keep moving here. So um, oxytocin is actually clearly important to both male and female bonding and is used with uh, everybody of all genders in animal experiments and human clinical trials. In humans, oxytocin is administered intranasally and so is unlikely to cross the blood brain barrier. Uh, this means that, um, so the monogamy gene is a vasopressin uh, receptor distribution gene. So the idea is that's how we know, right? That uh, vasopressin is, um, what's controlling male monogamy. Of course, the monogamy gene is a male gene because female monogamy, like I said, is obvious. Um, in humans, uh, oxytocin is administered intranasally, so it's unlikely to cross the blood-brain barrier. What this means is that the hormone binds with receptors in other parts of the body uh, in these trials. Um, and uh, vasopressin and oxytocin receptors in other parts of the body uh, have even greater receptivity, cross receptivity, not just between oxytocin and vasopressin, but also um, with other hormones like dopamine. Um, so reading this hormone story alongside Audre Lorde's uses of the erotic um, enabled me to start um, reading monogamy as a biopossibility instead of as something like a social construct or so Lord famously contends that painting a fence, talking about an idea, building a bookcase, writing a poem and making love to a woman as the light comes through the window um, are all of a kind, all examples of erotic experiences that make us aware of our own capacities for joy, fulfillment, satisfaction. The importance of mating, which is definitionally essential to the formation of pair bonds, is fully provincialized in her analysis of the reduction of the erotic's depth and breadth to sexuality's narrow functionality. Those processes researched and measured as monogamy in this light become more interesting. Rather than seeing monogamy or the capacity for couple bonds as normative and essential to human health and happiness, through this lens, we can imagine attachments and orientations to many objects and activities as creaturely capacities, as natural and important as the formation of pair bonds. And importantly, uh, people oriented to these different things wouldn't be biologically different from each other. It would be the exact same neural pathways. Um, Indeed, monogamy and by extension the family become intelligible as overdetermined biopossibilities whose narratives have often foreclosed other materializations. Materialisms that would reshape our knowing in transformative ways must be accountable to this imperative to interrogate the explanatory frameworks we've inherited. They must, must ask what the biologized categories in which we find ourselves invested are proxies for. What histories shape their intelligibility as the objects we know them as? And what knowledges are foreclosed by their naturalized status and ubiquity as categories of analysis? When and where we relinqu relinquish their hold on our imaginations, what else can we come to know and be? 
Appropriations and elaborations of the Lordian erotic have been particularly generative for doing at least two things. One, putting sex in its place, and two, rethinking the sexual and aesthetic, spiritual, and otherwise more than uh, capital B biological terms. Um, the two books I'm really thinking of here that I've been spending a lot of time with lately are Asexual Erotics and Funk the Erotic, respectively. I am going to focus on the latter today, but I have a lot to say about the worlds opened up by uh, asexual erotics. Um, so science studies needs these theories and archives of Eros. We also need post-positivist materialisms to guide us, lest we turn the erotic into a romantic replacement for sexuality treating it as the capital T truth beneath the misogyny and racism that gave us sexuality. So in the erotic life of racism, uh, Sharon Holland says, the challenge is to address Lord's assumption um, of the view that the erotic functions as a means to undo difference rather than facilitate its entrenchment. Holland says that rather than seeing desire as the force that conflicts with present order, the true essence in need of liberation, um, we should be concerned to read the erotic as, quote, a possible harbinger of the established order. She insists that we attune to the power racism wields in its ordering of family, generation, and desire in both black and white. We cannot afford to imagine Eros as autonomous from race or from history. Eros is not innocent. I take this caution seriously, seriously enough that it kept me up a couple nights before this talk, trying to figure out how to, how to treat this with care, but also hold out a little hope. Um, I'd like to return for a moment to my coupling example to flesh this out just a bit. Uh, so oxytocin has often been reduced in scientific storytelling to a gendered love hormone, but some materialist critics of compulsory monogamy, especially its most sexist articulations, have celebrated oxytocin's gender nonspecific capacity to connect us beyond the biological family or even to expand understandings of biological family. Um, while from a certain angle, this holds out exciting queer potential, some research on oxytocin looks at the flip side of those warm, fuzzy feelings of affective attachment. The willingness of individuals to compromise abstract ethical commitments when it benefits familiars. The naturalized link between love and material resources, without going into too much detail here, is most certainly a factor in the perpetuation of inequities. So desire is not innocent here, but rather implicated in the reproduction of systems of domination. So this force, Eros, even uncoupled from traditional sexual scientific storytelling is of history, and it needs to be theorized as such. Um, I just uh, remembered um, Sandra Harding saying exasperated once that a uh, um, uh, feminist epistemologies, methodologies, what is it, the FEMS conference, feminist epistemologies, methodologies, metaphysics, and science studies, FEMS, FISTS, we have all the best acronyms, uh, um, that we need a 12-step program for positivism. So uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Banu Subramaniam, and I published a short commentary a few years back suggesting that neuroscience's evolving attempts to know sexuality more completely, more queerly, was a fool's errand and musing on the persistence of capital B biology's will to knowledge. Sexual science, however expansive it tries to be, is oriented to pinning down. The upshot of our intervention was a shared desire to finally move away from making the same old critiques. Um, indeed, many of us working at the interstices of critical race studies, queer feminism, decolonial theory, and science studies felt somehow freed by Catherine McKittrick's Dear Science, based on my attendance at several reading groups and panels on the book. Um, so I think this is in part because while the epistemological intervention is familiar, the method challenges us to do something different, to stop endlessly engaging scientific storytelling as such.
do I go there yet? Okay, so the book is, among other things, a powerful meditation on and critique of the violence of positivism. It is importantly, centrally, also more than a critique. It's in fact also a critique of critique. She shows how the will to knowledge, even in our counter narratives and elegant histories of science's harms, objectifies, distorts, and forecloses possibilities. Our incessant attentiveness to anti-blackness and science joins the eugenic logics of the biology we've inherited in producing black inhumanism as quote, a scholarly requirement and makes black livingness unintelligible, unimaginable. McKittrick's poetics disrupt the persistent drive of academic logics of knowledge accumulation. She offers up us a vision of post-positivist methodologies that center storytelling, engaging capacious, capacious archives and resisting the colonial violence of knowing. Um, over the last decade or so, I've been deeply interested in how we queer feminists practice and might practice decolonial materialisms, how we attune to what McKittrick calls the materiality of our analytic worlds. I've joined a cadre of critics concerned that calls to turn or return to materiality and critical theory have often engendered a neo-positivism that takes for granted certain recognizably scientific ways of knowing as providing the best or least mediated access to insight into who and what we are. In my teaching and scholarship, as I've alluded, I, uh, I've critiqued the conflation of capital B biology, the disciplinary apparatus with small b biologies, the stuff, I've insisted on the necessity of tracking these slippages in our own storytelling and working to wrest the approach from the object instead of asking science about that which it has, it has claimed as its proper objects, like bodies, like life. I've advocated attuning to other stories, privileging other archives, carefully considering the incommensurability of analytics like matter, flesh, bodies, embodiment, life, livingness, and so on. Uh, I'm very interested if other people want to tell me more about it and how to think about things like flesh and matter together. Oh, I just saw the light in my room. Oh. Um, attuning to how the onto-epistemological valences of these objects shift in different sorts of stories and different modes of storytelling. In feminist STS, we do indeed spend a lot of time unpacking, critiquing, historicizing, what race, gender, and sexuality are in the scientific storytelling that informs dominant articulations of difference and the differential valuation of lives. So much energy is expended trying to rewrite and revise scientific storytelling about sexuality to show that the category has a history, that its intimate co-formation with colonialism and anti-Black racism are the conditions of its intelligibility. But what stories provincialize this critique, this history, what might be possible if we start from livingness rather than the racial sexual science out of which contemporary sep sexual subjectivities emerge? When we restory our worlds under the auspices of different political, economic, and epistemic commitments, should we call it science? I really wanna come back to that. I wanna talk with you all about this. So um, my dad's a mechanic and I grew up in a garage, so maybe that's why toolbox metaphors always really resonate with me. If we refuse to use certain tools, we have to do things differently, maybe reimagine the problem pretty fundamentally. Um, so for the aspiring queer feminist critical materialist, McKittrick offers us these tools. Diasporic literacy to replace traditional notions of expertise, curiosity, to replace positivism or imperial knowing, reading practices that resist false clarity uh, and espouse comfort with not knowing, um, and imagination over uh, what she poetically calls reams of evidence. Um, in my work, I've treated what I call dyke ethics as a kind of diasporic literacy, and I saw it with comic books, manifestos, and in perhaps the most sustained way with Audre Lorde's erotic about stories that can engender new ways of thinking about sexuality, relationality, and human nature. Um, let me do a quick time check here. Okay. Um, recently, I've been spending quality time with the work of other scholars who've taken up the theoretical work of Lorde's erotic 
in ways that open spaces of imagination and possibility. I found uh, Lamonda Horton Stallings work on funk and her black aesthetic rewriting of the erotic in particular, incredibly generative. So I've critiqued scientific storytelling uh, about monogamy on the one hand and queer and feminist storytelling about polyamory on the other as collaboratively reinscribing racist evolutionary temporalities. In brief, either monogamy or polyamory is superior, more evolved form of relationality, depending on who you ask. Um, Stallings makes a similar argument about the monogamy poly binary, problematizing the story and moral investments in the story that either constitutes an ethical practice. Stallings' materialist approach to sexual romantic relating beyond the dyad builds on a Lordian eros in what she calls stank matter. That is a form of creative energy generated by the self and the self's relationship to sacred forces. I can't see you all, so I can't tell who squirmed when I said sacred forces, but I feel like there's something uh, about our relative levels of comfort, you know, with um, these categories that, you know, mark certain kinds of unknowability um, that keep bringing us back to imperial ways of knowing. Um, so rather than focusing on the entrenchment of those monogamy and poly stories in scientific racism, Stallings is reading texts, songs, smut, post-humanist philosophy that reveal how, quote, funk has been offering a different genealogy for our present and future intimacies and relations. Drawing on this genealogy, she reimagines re relationality through, quote, funk's emphasis on app emphasis on affect, creativity, aesthetics, and especially improvisation. Funk through these mechanisms does a few things, creates new myths, structures, and points of origin for neo-erotic models of hum humanity. Um, reminds me again of some classic Haraway, we need science, our myth, like we need all the other resources at our disposal. So this, um, this active claim of creating uh, new myths that we, we need, um, I felt very compelled by. Um, funk also centers non-visual sensory perception, smell, movement, mood. Funk is about smell and the valuation of the olfactory, the smell of hard work, artistic integrity. Um, and importantly, uh, funk is an object of imagination. Imagination is, part of sexuality's becoming through the lens of funk. Stallings offers a thoroughgoing critique of Foucault's binary of ars erotica and scientia sexualis, arguing that genealogies of sexual knowledge that defy these knowledge systems have been largely ignored in the writing of re and rewriting of the history of sexuality. Thematizing imagination is key. When sexuality is theorized as imaginative experience, she says, it becomes art as experience and less bound by capitalism's emphasis on production and biopower's reproductive ordering of time. It becomes embodied knowledge. Um, so what if we insisted on plurality, unknowability, imagination, and sacred forces as essential elements in the making of sexuality? What if we held nature cultural engagements with sexuality accountable to something like, uh, to love the humanistic methodology of putting a bunch of words together and seeing if they work? Um, of uh, something like a funky erotic biopossibility um, that would foreground imagination um, as work, as force, as energetic processes, as McKittrick and Stallings do, uh, inviting us to thematize the narrative conditions of possibility for desire, the imaginaries that shape settler sexuality and other aspects of racism's erotic life can be thematized alongside those that seem to operate on wholly different registers. Um, it would also think sex as more than libidinal in the Freudian sense, but as multi-sensory, um, 
which would open space for thinking capaciously about desires embodiment, how we recognize and experience it. If sexual storytelling fails to think through feeling in meaningful sensory ways, very Lordian, uh, we can assess its rigor lacking. Uh, a funky erotic biopossibility would also be anti-universalist and anti-individualizing. Funky erotic biopossibilities would be understood as grounded in collectives, local knowledges, not attempts to characterize all desire or to subsume or explain away variation. Where could we use these guidelines? Uh, in our critiques of and creative engagements with sexual science, and our attempts to proliferate narrative resources that might contribute to these new myths, structures, and points of origin. And why, to what end? Um, because the more deeply we feel, the more compassion we have for our own creatureliness and that of human and non-human others. Because if we learn to feel each other, we might yet imagine worlds in which the family isn't the unit of allegiance. We might be better. The end. Great. Thank you so much um, for that talk. And there's so many elements that are coming together and woven, and you draw so creatively on, on so many people. I love the uh, the notion at the end too of thinking of imagination as work and as desire. So I'm just gonna uh, give a few minutes to, for people to put some questions and answers in there and I'll, I'll look at them, but I've got a, a bunch myself. And uh, one thing you just kind of mentioned as a, as a quick uh, move is wondering about the like more than like just critique of science around this kind of like active engagement. I see your work being so much of that and I feel like for me with my first forays into STS and probably that probably at my first way in was through Sandra Harding's um, work originally but thinking of you're asking uh, do we still want to call it science and what does it mean to be creatively engaged with that sexual science or other forms of scientific production. And that's the place where I'm really excited and kind of curious about. And I'm just wondering about where you, you mentioned this a bit in your talk, but like where you see the kind of slippery slope of it, where do you see the kind of interesting frisson of possibility of like having these conversations where it breaks from this super rigid positivism or radical ahistoricism or whatever problematic ism that may be uh, going on. Like, where do you like, tell, tell me a bit about your, your thoughts and experiences with this. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm having a lot of thoughts about this. I feel like it's, um, there's not, there's not a good answer. I feel like it's a, uh, it's a real ethical problem that we doing this work together like need to be talking about. Like um, Sarah Giordano uh, talks about like needing to make space for anti-science and how the love of science has actually like as a discourse replaced the idea of scientific expertise. Like now we're supposed to all like love science and want to be scientists again and like how it, it produces this kind of, um, you know, it allows us to access a kind of epistemic authority. Mm -hmm. um, and and so, so then part of the question is like, how do we strategically deploy that kind of authority? And how do we think about, you know, what it, what it means to, um, to level the epistemic playing field? Do we do it by calling everything science? Or yeah. how do we do it by, um, you know, putting science in its place. Um, in the epilogue of Undoing Monogamy, I, I actually, I don't, I don't know how well it worked, but it still works for me, like, logically. Mm -hmm. um, I quoted Annie Sprinkle, you know, saying, if, if porn sucks, 
you know, if it's misogynist and, you know, manifesting horrors, then the goal maybe shouldn't be censorship, but to make more porn. And I think maybe like, I, I want the kind of space to engage science the way we have porn, you know, that um, when we start to, if you look at the kind of work that Annie Sprinkle is doing now, you know, the, um, the eco-sexual, um, like it's certainly some people would say it doesn't count, you know, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. make people in it, but um, so like under what kinds of, you know, economic epistemic conditions are we like producing stories that do or don't count according to certain audiences. And right now I'm thinking about these questions a lot in terms of pedagogy, like hmm. um, what, like what kinds of understanding of our nature would we like young people to have? I don't know. Mm. Wow, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and too, I feel like like the, the atmosphere and environment for talking about science, especially in the States and to some degree Canada, compared to most of the rest of the world is so circumscribed by a kind of like the anti-science or where it's like, um, do you believe in science or not is one of the questions, or it's like kind of which side of the kind of Darwin debate. And so, and then scientists have for so long been so reactive against these forces and these threats. And so it just seems so deeply Entrenched. I'm just curious, are you, are there some biologists or some kind of, um, you know, kind of queer science scholars working in conjunction with scientists that you think are doing interesting, productive thing where you do think that there's some forms of? Well, I think Max's work is super exciting. Um, can you pronounce Max's last name for me? Oh, uh, I think it is uh, Labaron, but I am not 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that's like the book, yeah, Pollution as Colonialism, yeah. which I found totally mind blowing. And it's still like even hard to fully like embody, but what they are doing is, is, is kind of amazing. And to think about, you know, working with the ubiquity of plastics, but in such a, a different way than like the kind of category of plastics are bad or thinking about what our obligations are to the the other species that we're doing research with, like what they're saying about being in good relations to the fish that they're researching with and the ethics of that is, uh, it, it's very far reaching. Yeah, so I think that is a good example. Any others that are? Yeah, well, uh, back in, I think it came out in 2017, uh, Banu Subramaniam and I uh, co-edited a double special issue of Catalyst, Feminism Theory Technoscience on Feminism Sciences. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to really like see what people would do if we asked them to, you know, sort of take up that mantle and tell stories about the stuff. Um, mm -hmm from a more critical theory perspective. And we ended up getting like 70. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was crazy. That's why it ended up being a double special issue. And one of them ended up being a remaking sciences and the other was um, science out of feminist theory. Um, and some were like much more grounded in critical theory. And then some were like, you know, real kinds of rethinking deep engagement with like veterinary sciences, with mm -hmm. robotics, you know, with specific mm -hmm. fields. Yeah. And the, the capaciousness of, you know, what people were doing, like auto ethnographic, you know, documentation of disabilities, like all mm -hmm. kinds of things. And I think I'm really interested in incommensurability, in cooperation. Yeah. Like, I think there's there's so much um, that we could be more imaginative about if we just told more stories. So that's why I find Annie Sprinkle so generative. Just more, more, more. You know. Yeah, yeah, more and more. <laughs> yeah, not just not just the kibosh on bad science, but like what kinds of, I mean, I'm always interested, like what kinds of whole openings are already foreclosed by so many assumptions. And so um, and the fact that you could have done a triple issue just two shows that 
there's so much, there's so many, I think, creative hidden things that are going on that we have no idea about. And so how do we create the space that kind of attracts those folks to be in some kind of a conversation and, and share that? Yeah. I sometimes ask students, what, what do you know about bodies and where did you learn it? And you give them a couple minutes to write it down and then we go around. And it's yeah. surprising how much information that people value about embodiment that they learned from like stand-up comedy or, you know. So I feel like just uh, randomly claiming things as science is also, you know. Um, I don't know, evacuating it of its uh, of its authority by spreading yeah. it around, I think does. Yeah, and like I, you're not saying um, only cite peer reviewed articles, please, in your <laughs> in your discussions. So, I mean, that's it's an interesting kind of position, too, is what is the importance of challenging the capital S or the capital of science or the capital B of biology? Um, and it's interesting too, because like these kind of institutions that that still want to support that, how amenable are they to that kind of provincializing? Um, but maybe it's the proliferation of other compelling forms. I, I hope that that proliferation will also set capital S scientists free because, mm -hmm. you know, they are beholden to funding structures that, you know, are invested in profit and you know can only know certain kinds of things for structural reasons. So it's not about like winning the hearts and minds of scientists. It really is a structural problem. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Here I'm just going to grab one of the questions that this is from uh, V Saria, who says, "Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, listening to your talk, I thought of how public health knows this, knows about." the funky erotic bio possibility, but sees it as a ghost that needs to be exercised. An elephant in the room that should not be addressed. In your provocation, how does disease and death appear? How do we rework another strain of inquiry that is the coupling of eros and death, Bataya, or if you prefer the death drive, Lacan? So give you that, that, that amazing question. That is an amazing question. Thank you so much for that question. I don't think I have an adequate answer, but um, if you email me so I know who you are, I will think about it and email you back because I'm going to be, I'm going to be thinking about it anyway, but uh, let's see. Uh, could you, can I read the question or can you? Yeah, it's in the Q&A if you can see it. That might be easier. It's yeah. Oh, this is such a good question. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> I, I, I. Well, can we just start to play with it a second? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's talk about it. I think. It's really interesting idea that like public health and also like other realms of knowledge production has a like has that you know spooky spider sense of what you're talking about. And I think what V is kind of alluding to here, and this is just a guess, but like that that there is this kind of structured way of kind of 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 keeping that out of keeping that aside because of its the various um uh problematic uh or challenges the complexities the challenges the question of like radical plur plurality ONV's uh doing a little clarification coming from more than four decades of hiv prevention yeah, yeah. thank you for that clarification i i had a hunch that <laughs> so um one of the sites for the the production of monogamy really is like uh, STD prevention work, you know, sort of like part of uh, the the way the materiality of monogamy and non-monogamy are produced are the presence or absence of, mm -hmm. you know, STIs. Um, there's um, 
I really like th this ghost, this like specter of funk in public health, I think is brilliant. <laughs> and I hope that you are writing a book about this. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, just that, and that too, you wonder just with other realms, with other scientists too, it's like this sense that this this is present, but it's this kind of like unspeakable, utterly challenging formation that is just like avoided at at all costs. <laughs> yeah. And it can't really be reckoned with. I wonder. I, I do these like uh, queer feminist science studies research practicums. Usually they're like group independent studies with folks who are taking classes, you know, in the natural sciences and critical theory. And public health students really struggle with the conservatism of their discipline to try to figure out how to like creatively bring pieces these pieces together and I I think yeah it's just such a it's such an important uh site for thinking about the reproduction of sexuality really um, mm -hmm. among other things it's its categories of analysis are so deeply entrenched in its funding structures, you know, in the intelligibility of the questions, mm. its moralism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I wanted to get back to like to something you said from uh, from Linda Burke, and I love I don't know if you ever seen but Linda Burke had a great piece too on thinking about gender for uh, non-humans as well that I loved. And that was, I feel like resonates with part of the Donna Haraway and kind of sensibility of like, let's just not make this easy division between sex and gender and let, you know, think of sex as the same as biology and genders, the cultural realm. And then you say, um, we can't leave biology to the biologists and from Linda Burke. And if you could just, um, Think about too how actually has an awareness of like the history of these concepts or a sense of gender already been inflecting um, the production of biology. So it's not like it's not like it's innocent and separate. Like it's already yeah. going in there. Or we see like in primate visions, Donna Haraway's amazing book or other things. They're like glimpses of it. But how do you kind of also like? see that that kind of entanglement kind of working out too when i was observing in the laboratory where they uh discovered the monogamy gene <laughs> um uh larry young's laboratory at yerkes primate research center um it's a vole laboratory and mm. you know, voles are little tiny um rodents and um the, of course it's all this gendered storytelling and in the lab people casually call them the husband and the wife or um and um of course you know as a queer feminist theory person I like the first day I was there I was like how do you sex the bulls you know <laughs> they're like oh well it's really difficult to sex them you know um so it is really difficult to sex rodents and um they're very tiny and they just measure the space between the little dot that is their genitals and their anus and if they get it wrong they find out because they're housed sex segregated they find out that they made a mistake because there's babies <laughs> and if there aren't babies they assume that they didn't make a mistake also a strange mm. assumption right. and then a lot of assumptions based on uh sexing and they're actually like multiple kinds of what we would think of as intersex you know uh configurations of sex characteristics and voles and um you know uh when i asked about same sex pair bonds they were like well the you know male male pair bonds is impossible you know because 
they would they're territorial and they would kill each other uh. and you know and female female pair bonds is impossible because that's just friendship oh interesting yeah <laughs> um, uh, mating is what you know you know so okay. the gender is all mm. over the place in the vol lab yeah. and and it's utterly incoherent and everybody knows yeah. you know that gender is like being operationalized for a certain purpose in order to be able to make a connection to biology that mm. mating allows you to make yeah yeah. Um, otherwise you're just like watching animals and telling stories you know like all of us at the dog park or you know with our fish tanks or um so uh so that the gendered storytelling is really about being able to tell a certain kind of story about mating in order to make certain kinds of claims about biology mm -hmm. and yeah the the gendering of voles I found really really interesting and observing the vol observing the voles um I found their like the imposition of gender <laughs> into mm, yeah. interpretations of their behavior it's impossible to tell watching them you know uh -huh. anything gendery or romantic or anything like that is going on they appear to be staging a prison break <laughs> they're trying to get out at yeah, all they're, they're trying to remove the shunts from each other's oh. heads and the ties from around each other's necks they're trying to mm. um i mean they're the storytelling in the lab is that they're trying to remove foreign objects from each other as they would in nature which is mutual grooming which is what families right. do yeah um, but there seems to be a lot of situational solidarity there that i would i would interpret differently yeah so what happened when you when you did interpret differently or did you find people in the lab that were interested in like rethinking their gendered expectations or well, it just not possible the fact that i am not a trained ethnographer in any way shape or form played a big role in how that went because i just said things to them like that sounds crazy you know like, <laughs> that's the most sexist thing i've ever heard or like that sounds like a story from the onion you know right and uh, so people responded to me just as candidly, and they're like, "Yeah, well, you know, it's a it's a quick and dirty proxy for, you mm. know." So, um, you know, they're smart and they know, and yeah. you know, they're um, the investments in gender here really are, you know, functional for certain kinds of purposes to be able to make certain kinds of claims about biology so that, you know, the the things that they're testing, I mean, specifically in the context of the laboratory, so that the oxytocin that they're testing, for example, to cause the not pair bonding species of voles to form pair bonds can be used in clinical trials to try to treat autism because in the in the lab um uh pair bond formation is a proxy for healthy sociality the capacity to form bonds um to uh have um uh, reward um activation in interactions with familiars um and um, and then uh, not forming pair bonds, uh, you know, according to the arbitrary sort of measures that cut off, you know, monogamy from non-monogamy. Um, you know, it becomes a, a proxy for, um, you know, engagement with familiars not being rewarding. And so if something can make the, um, the vol who uh, enjoys being alone, <laughs> Yeah. Or the company of strangers, you know, um, want to spend more time with a familiar than it, you know, can be sold. So the pharmaceuticalization of everything really kind of plays a big role in the gender mm -hmm. things. It's really like that clearly kind of connected. It's less about like just misogynist investments in gender or, you know, heteronormative investments. Right. And then, I mean, of course, it's it is all of those things, but it's it's quite functional. That stuff is so entrenched. It's all tied up together. 
Yeah, that's fascinating. I had no idea about those like adjustments. There's no that realm of like pure, full sociality knowledge. It's so deeply tied into like surrogates for humanness and a certain sense of like proper sociality and uh, the bond. Yeah, that's really interesting. I want to grab another one of the questions. This is from Amanda Watson. Um, she says, thank you so much for this talk. I'd love if you talk a bit more about imagination perhaps imagination as work, and how you might grapple with the futurist orientation of imagination. Ooh, that's so true. And the sort of queer refusal of this. How do we think strategically about fantasizing or daydreaming, and also resist the understanding of our present moment as one of which we should be thinking ahead? And then also a little follow up. I'm thinking specifically about eco grief and both antinatalist responses and Fridays for Future type ideas about young people having a future and the promiscuity of these responses. It's in the Q&A if that's a pretty big question for you, if you want to look at it. Angie. Yeah. I'm I'm rereading it, thank you. So um, I am I'm very sympathetic to the critique of uh, a futurist kind of orientation. And I don't think that Stallings is using imagination in uh, a futurist sort of a way. I think she's using it to describe um, an aspect of improvisation, which is um, spontaneous and relational. And um, so I think it's like hmm. quite um, in line with those critiques. Um, it's really like, um, more of a response to, uh, you know, even a post moralist ethical mode that suggests, uh, a, you know, a way of life um, that is oriented towards um, invention and so on and so forth. Um, and it's, it's really quite presentist in many ways, which is part of what I found mm. compelling about it. Um, and I want to know more about eco grief. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it's so strange not to be able to talk to people. I know. Um, hi, Amanda. <laughs> I would like to know more about eco grief. I uh, I feel like I should Google it right now and make sure that I didn't just confess. I don't know what it is. If it's something I really should know what it is. I feel like it's something I should know what it is. <laughs> I'm not really going to Google something while we're in Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> well, we can we can um, give it a sec, and maybe Amanda will um, explain explain more. But we can kind of go into something else. One thing I so I have uh, Dear Science on my like book to, you know, bookshelf to ferment, as some people say, or to ripen, you know, I'm excited about reading it. I'm just curious, like, how did McKittrick's book, you talked a little bit about it in the talk, but if you could say more about how has it influenced and shaped your orientation to the kinds of things you want to do or what you feel excited about thinking with or working towards, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it sounds like a really complex book and I'm not quite sure uh, like from what, how you're describing it, like where it would lead me. And I'm just curious in terms of your own encounters. Um, so uh, the, the playlist of, you know, uh, beats and songs from the book, I've- Oh, right. Really, um, generative also to like listen to while I read the book and listen to while I'm thinking about the book. The fact that efforts have been made through the poetic style, through the um, 
you know, the playlist to make reading the book a multi-sensory experience. It's really a beautiful book to read. Mm. Um, and um, I felt like it gave me permission to stop repeating something that I feel like I've, I've just been doing my whole, since my comps, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and uh, I think a lot of us have this nagging feeling, you know, that we're like, we're like incessantly telling stories about the scientific storytelling at the center of logics of domination and, you know, the intelligibility of our worlds as we know them depends on histories of scientific racism and where like, I'm teaching a class on the history of race and sexuality in the US right now. That's what it's about. It's about the co-formation of racial and sexual science and how, you know, everything that you think is sexy and wonderful, <laughs> you know, now like Valentine's Day is ruined forever, you know, like it, it is a, you know, a white supremacist colonial legacy. And I, there was something in, you know, McKittrick's like, we're, you know, we're, we're reinscribing this mm. anti-blackness with mm. the, the politics of, the politics and poetics of uh, the distribution of our attention. Mm. Like, oh, yeah. And she has this really beautiful, like, line that it stop her autopsy mm. they can't wow. have everything wow yeah it's interesting it's almost like yes that's all true and we all need to know it but yeah <laughs> so much more yeah yeah uh, stop the autopsy oh here amanda um got back to us she says ha i am laughing i guess expressions experiences of grieving a future in the present related to climate change in particular. A BA student here, Sarah Law, is doing work on this. Yeah, so I didn't know that that um, term either, eco-grief, but I've certainly, the expression or the sense too of like part of this hugely expanding kind of mental health crisis, especially around like young adults and, and the relationality to climate change and the idea of the inability to imagine a viable future, I think is, is part of that. So mm -hmm. yeah, do you have thoughts on that then? I, I just keep thinking of, um, I've heard it attributed to different people, so I don't know who to, but the, that quote that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Yeah. I, I definitely so, have. Graham maybe. Who? Could be Gibson Graham. Okay. I I have I have definitely felt that is true, you know, and I think in some ways many of us who are doing this work, you know, like trying to give some attentiveness to the the creative piece of this, you know, this project of mm -hmm. knowing and becoming otherwise, like one of the things that I feel like we have in common is that like we're really like the critical pieces of our work are really aimed sharply at whatever uh, target we see as an obstacle to imagining something other than the end of the world, you know? Um, uh, we should be able to imagine the end of capitalism. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. So I think um maybe i do have investments in you know futurist understandings of imagination but i i don't think we're like planning for a particular world i think we're just practicing mm -hmm. if that makes sense i feel yeah. like that, that practice makes us um i don't know um more able to inhabit mm. 
post-capitalist sensibilities. I, I really, when I think about the future, I really think how do we interrupt the values of like resource hoarding, you know, mm -hmm. that are just so much a part of, you know, how we live in settler North America, you know, like we just, I, how do we literally divest, you know, mm -hmm. how do we invest more in collective futures? How do we invest in a post-capitalist world? How do we have something to lose if we don't achieve that instead of, you know, having something to lose if we don't, you know, if we can't afford to retire? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting too. we're saying about like not going towards one particular world. And I feel like, too, in terms of some of my forays into these realms of thinking and being, it's it is precisely against the kind of like universalist or like singularity logic that we may be head, heading towards. So that's part of what is is really interesting. Are you just seeing um, Amanda's? Uh, oh, you're typing an answer. <laughs> oh, I was just trying to send smiley faces. <laughs> okay. So that, yeah, I liked what I liked what you were saying there. Tell me more about the, like, just thinking about the, like the practices of like diasporic literacy. Can you, you mentioned a bit of that and like. What does that mean? I'm trying to also think about, I would love to do myself an exchange with, there's this amazing microbiologist at University of Hawaii, Margaret McFall Nye, you've probably heard about her through the, uh, the squid and bacteria relationships that Donna Haraway talks about. And I got to meet her a while back in Hawaii. And we talked about exchanging students, like kind of like lab, her like lab students would like learn critical social theory and like kind of go back and forth. It'd almost be like, you know, the Vol students uh -huh. come to the class at, at, um, at, at five colleges. So, but it's like, what, so what would it mean in terms of maybe the diasporic literacy or other ways to like think differently with these students of science who are, who are there in the labs? Like what would, how, how can you imagine that? Mm. Um, well, I want to be careful first to like connect it to its context and not like import it around too much without like thinking mm. it through. Um, so, you know, um, McKittrick uh, talks about like black livingness and um, uh, black cultural production as archives of uh, the meaning of blackness that exceed um, the archive of racial science. Mm. And um, so she's interested in these, what she calls diasporic literacies that, you know, um, make it possible to tell these stories, you know, these stories that are, like actually everything is not just the product of, you know, racist storytelling. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think the specificity of it uh, is significant, but I also think it's a really very useful way of um, resisting that uh, that unity of science impulse, you know, it's a gr great way of thematizing uh, mm -hmm. the importance of incommensurability. Like mm -hmm. we, we need local stories because we become in context, you know, where, um, so I, I love this idea of like, people like moving around and, you know, <laughs> inhabiting different sort of spaces and being, you know, someone who can make what's happening in a space strange, you know, mm -hmm. like the person who like comes in from somewhere else and asks the questions that make people think like, what are we not seeing here? Like, what are we, 
you know? yeah i mean I, i'm so curious like on. what the fact of your presence in the full lab <laughs> well they did, get, they did get a lot more careful about saying husbands and wives <laughs> um, yeah but like just curious if you're staying in conversation with any of the folks too like afterwards and how it's all like seeping through in other ways or questioning some of the other the other elements or like the idea of like hyper gendered hormones which are not like exclusive or or other dynamics well um like generations later of grad students in the vol lab uh i know have read my book oh wow um and there are folks at a a vol lab i can't <laughs> remember i went to a bunch of universities in california when i was doing book talks and I don't want to get it wrong. I think that it was at Davis. Okay. But I could be wrong. But um, a group of grad students from a Vol lab there came to my talk and I ended up sitting with them and talking. And, you know, and they're, I think what we're seeing is like generations of folks coming up who have been studying you know critical race theory and queer right. theory and they're doing graduate degrees in neuroscience or um evolutionary biology and they understand the incommensurability of these epistemologies and they also understand that their disciplines don't allow for incommensurability <laughs> so they are like trying to figure out mm you know, how to tell these stories in a way that's more accountable. And, you know, a lot of folks end up defecting. That's, I mean, we wouldn't have STS if it weren't for defectors. But, <laughs> um, but I, uh, I do wonder, um, like what kinds of spaces, mm -hmm. you know, like we, fostering spaces or hostile spaces or yeah yeah like what what kind of mm. um and part of it's about figuring out where to get paid right like <laughs> yeah how, how we can get paid to do this kind of research that you know deals with the these sorts of incommensurability yeah um, i I'm, I'm very excited about uh, like Zoe's talk, you know, is really like, it's it's very specific, it's very local and there are, you know, theoretical aspects that are generalizable, but the intervention that she's trying to make. And I think that, a, so a lot of folks are doing this, you know, from the space of the humanities. Yeah. Uh, but I, uh, and, and some folks are even publishing in, you know, science journals. So I, I don't know, like, uh. um, like where the, the, the weak points are, you know, where we can uh, start to make some more inroads and, you mm -hmm. know, being able to uh, make smaller those stories that make it hard to proliferate. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's great. And it's so, inter it's so helpful for me too, to think like, oh, it's like these kind of key gatekeepers of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, that have been entrenched for 40 years or whatever that kind of dominate these realms, but reminding me of like the annual emergence of like, you know, new graduate students that have been shaped by these questions that these are like meaningful and important to them and about how, yeah, trying to reconcile, you know, figure out ways or spaces or creating new niches um, within labs, within, within places where they can kind of go deep into these questions or even create new forms of, of relationships, new forms of of knowledge so yeah i'm so glad i want to we're actually we ran out of time a little bit ago and so glad that you got to see zoe todd's beginning lecture and you're one of the last of our series and just how you were able to both like pull on that but also push in some 
kind of shared ways of, of, of rethinking, you know, what we know about the natural world. And I'm so delighted that you're able to join us and have have a conversation and, and with others and and learn so much from that. So thank you to you and thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's great. All right, take care, everyone. We will have one more talk uh, April 20th, and we will send out an email where we send out um, Angie's uh, the recorded video from this talk. And so hope to see you uh, next month. All right, take care, everybody. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.